Hello, Rola. Welcome to the show. Mm, thank you for having me. It's such a privilege to get to have this conversation with you. I've, I've been really looking forward to this uh, for some weeks now that we've been planning this. Mm, me too. Let's do it. Great. Well, so the first thing uh, I'd like to invite you to speak about is really to help our audience know a little bit about the context of you and mm -hmm. your background. Um, specifically, you know, of course, I know that you're an anesthesiologist by training. Uh, you're in London, I believe. Is that right? Mm -hmm. UK? That's yeah. right. And uh, born in Syria. And um, you gave an incredibly moving TED Talk uh, a few years mm -hmm. ago. I would encourage mm -hmm. anyone to go listen to that mm -hmm. on YouTube or anywhere they, they want to do that. And, um, you know, I, I see you as really a powerhouse leader of change in the world. And so I'm really excited to to hear about the inner workings of such a leader and how you came to be who you are first. And and then we'll go into more of what you're into now and what you're where you're uh, applying your energy to affect change in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So how did you were you a young person who thought, you know, I'm going to grow up and be a doctor or how did you, how do you relate to that question mm. about getting involved in the practice of medicine? You know, I actually think I was born a doctor <laughs> because I remember growing up in Damascus and, and playing with my siblings and cousins and our Barbies and Cindy's and insisting on being the surgeon, performing the life-saving surgery on them. Um, and so when we moved to the UK, I was age 12. I didn't speak any English then. And when it came to applying to universities, uh, three years later, my teachers told me my grades weren't good enough and I should apply to medicine, to, to biology or chemistry instead, which I thought was preposterous. I was like, of course, I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> and I applied and one medical school saw my potential. Um, and, um, and here I am now 20 years later after qualification. And I would say that I've always been driven by the belief that access to healthcare is a fundamental human right. And that I was, I think, aware of the fact that there were haves and have nots of it because of growing up in Syria. And so alongside of my anesthesiology training in the UK, I was always working in sub-Saharan Africa alongside local health providers to help bring whatever expertise and training I could or just lend a hand and be a, you know, a bum on a seat as it were and, and, and working alongside my local colleagues, whether it was in Uganda, Kenya or Ethiopia um, and, um, and working to reinforce that, yeah, local health provision as much as I could. And really I'd envisioned, envisioned uh, a life in global health mm. and um, until war started in Syria and, entirely change the trajectory of my life. Mm, wow. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thank you for, for sharing all that. And so it sounds like this is a, this is a new layer. I didn't know about you that you were very involved in uh, global health and um, going to Africa, offering your services uh, throughout. Um, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the first thing that happened uh, when with the war in Syria started it was sort of an exclamation point on what you were already mm. aware of and working on yeah i mean i was i was um very much working in the in a resource low setting mm. but it was in a development setting and in a stable setting and suddenly i was sort of catapulted you know when in 2011 the peaceful protests calling for freedom and dignity were met with bullets and bombs and suddenly war broke out across the country and my family were affected from pretty early on we lost over 30 members of my family in mm. 2012 and in 2013 
and um, that I did the only thing I knew I could and I joined the humanitarian effort. And so I was working as an anesthesiologist in the UK, but I would then spend my you know, evenings, weekends, um, and holidays, fundraising, you know, on Skype, um, remember Skype, (laughs) 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 on Skype, building hospitals and clinics and, and doing whatever I could. And, and then in the holidays I would go and I would do medical missions to help, you know, do needs assessments, be a clinician, um, and help provide that, that, um, that healthcare, um, and, and humanitarian aid. So it was, it was a, although it was still in the health sector and or in the health sphere, it was an entirely different. different it was personal setting. for a yeah. start. It was personal for a start, um, and and there's something particularly traumatizing when you know that it is a fellow human being causing the suffering of a fellow human being. Like it's one thing when I've worked in the context of a natural disaster, like you, it's just, it's nature. But when it was a human being who knows they are dropping a napalm bomb on the school, Mm. right? Like there is something so deeply fracturing of that, that it made such a, yeah such a huge difference to the experience of being a provider in that context. Mm. And well, and were you, did you go to Syria during the early conflict? Yes. To, yeah. Um, I would, I would um, travel into Northern Syria from Southern Turkey um, because going through Damascus was no longer safe. Um, pretty much most um, medics and aid workers who were um, daring to um, save lives of civilians in areas that were outside of government areas, which were um, the majority of where the war was happening. They were um, deemed traitors to the state and um, arrested, tortured or killed. Um, and this is something that not many people know that, you know, Physicians for Human Rights have documented over 600 attacks on medical facilities in Syria. And, mm. you know, nearly a thousand of our colleagues have been killed. Um, uh, 40% of them under torture for being physicians and health workers providing medical aid to civilians that the state does not want to be saved. Um, and so I would go from, from the northern, from the northern borders through Turkey. And um to be honest, the parts of Syria that I'd never been to before, that I didn't mm. know. Um mm. and and it was um very eye-opening um to see that rural and ordinarily quite poor part of Syria, but now with literally millions of the internally displaced people who had come in waves and waves from the southern parts of the country up towards Turkey um, in the hope that they might be able to make it across the border to, 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 to safe haven. Um, and And, you know, it was during one of these medical missions that I witnessed, you know, so many war crimes, um, like a school full of children being bombed with an apalm bomb and and, and dozens of these severely burnt children coming into one of the hospitals that we had helped to set up, that I'd helped to set up. And um, I think one of the most devastating things to any health worker is when you know you are providing inadequate and substandard clinical care. Sure. Right? Like, I knew these children needed to be intubated and ventilated and sedated and sent in an ambulance, you know, fully monitored to a tertiary referral center to, to treat with, to treat their severe burns. And instead, you know, despite my best efforts and the best efforts of my tiny team, you know, we had to send many of them choking and in pain Mm. in the back of their parents' cars. Mm. Um, 
And children died that day because I, who had the knowledge, skill and ability to, to administer potentially life-saving treatments, didn't have access to those tools, resources mm -hmm. and equipment that I needed. Mm -hmm. um, and and that I, I didn't that deeply impacted me, but it would take years for me to, to figure out that actually mm. it had traumatized me mm. because I think so many of us normalize and just get on with the traumatic stress and the traumatic incidents that we experience because right. to us it's normal, right? Right. It's normal. And, and the experiences or symptoms we might be having or not, even if we have a, a clinical background and we know what PTSD is, we don't fit into a category, we don't recognize, maybe we're not having flashbacks or we're not having nightmares. We may be right. having physical symptoms or other manifestations of trauma. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think when I eventually did fall into a valley of 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 what I initially called burnout and then realized was just um a mountain of undealt with grief and um and trauma that had taken up every home in every cell of my body. Um, you know, I'd realized that um you know, not only had medicine and my training not really prepared me to prevent, recognize, or manage it, mm -hmm. um, but it didn't really provide me with the tools that I needed to, to heal myself. Like, I feel like mm -hmm. somehow medicine has moved away from healing, even. We've mm -hmm. become about super specialist care that sees a part of a physical body and the wholeness is left at the door. It's like we, somehow are like flat earthers we see like the two dimensions of a body and then we 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 we've we've forgotten the energetic we've forgotten the spiritual and the emotional um or at least that's what it what it um felt like now but yeah to your point about the trauma i honestly used to tell people like it's amazing how untraumatized I am considering how much I've been through and how much I've seen you know like I genuinely mm -hmm. I genuinely believe that because like you said I was like well I'm not having flashbacks and I'm not having nightmares and you know I'm functioning I'm highly functioning in fact you know so um but you know I didn't realize that the nasty voice of shame that plagued me was trauma right I thought yes. that was just like normal guilt that was keeping me being a good activist right like that voice right. of like how dare you how dare you think about you uh, get back to right. work right like right. that that nasty like I had no I always used to be like okay yeah you're right like who am I right. to complain like just get back right. to work you right and right. like it, it took me a long time to realize that that was a manifestation of trauma. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They're sneaky. Yeah, and it, they are sneaky. So sneaky. sneaky. Yeah. And, and, and I would say, you know, in, in a uh, life and death situation, those parts of us could be life-saving to focus us on survival. Uh, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, uh, once those voices as you say, take, take up home and the cells in your body, uh, they don't retire when the, um, life and death situation has, has ceased. Uh, and you know, they, they persist, right. Until yes. we, until we get the right kind of care and attention. One thing that comes up for me, I'm curious w with you having been trained in the UK in medicine over here, uh, with the, I guess we call them Yankees, <laughs> the the Yanks. Uh, yes, <laughs> we um, we're we're heavily traumatized inside of medical training itself. You know, there's mm. uh, there's a culture of shame, of shaming uh, medical students that's very um, toxic, and mm. uh, and and so 
you know, when, when you talk about medicine, not offering you the tools or the, the ways of under, even understanding your experiences, trauma, part of what I relate to over here as an American physician is also the layer of, um, you know, essentially being told that if you don't have your shit together, if you're not a, you know, rock solid, you know, unemotional, unassailable, a uh, person with all the answers for the suffering right. people, then the messaging is you're a worthless physician. Um, right. So look, I, I remember reading Atul Gawade's book about um, on being mortal, and mm. there was a line in that that just hit me right in the in the face of and that the the physician who doesn't have the answers is a worthless physician, and that's exactly how. I felt uh, in training. Anyway, it's another layer mm. of what I think you're talking about. And do, do is it the same in the UK for physicians coming up through training? Would you say? I think that we are, you know, traumatized professionals within a traumatized profession, right? Mm. And and this is the problem: is that this is what you described, and that shaming is is someone else who's been shamed and you know they're now just passing it on and and you know until we as a profession realize that we we what we are calling burnout is not burnout it is trauma until we actually start to recognize that manage that and break that cycle Mm. we're going to continue to to you know to pass that on to the next generations. You know, I didn't ever at any point, there's definitely a bit of that shaming here. I think, you know, I I don't know how it would compare, but, you know, there is still the problem of like poor leadership when it comes to Mm. your own health and wellness. You know, I have never had a senior tell me to look after myself about boundaries, about self-care, you know, right. um, and they don't model it, right. right? And and actually, I think the new generation now is looking for more life balance. And actually, the older, more senior, um, you know, um, you know, uh, members are like, what the fuck? What do you mean? Like, like work-life right. balance? Like, I don't have work-life balance. You should, you're not going to get work-life right. balance. And, you know, and if I'm expected to work 24-7, then sure as hell you're expected right. to work 24-7, yeah. right? And how dare and you? So right. how dare you, right? Yeah. And it's, yeah. And it's it's partly why I feel passionate about speaking out about not only sharing my experiences, but becoming one of these voices that says mm. we we need to reimagine medicine how it is to mm. be a healthcare professional yes um because right now we are taking so many of us i mean this was one of my profoundest realizations when i kind of recovered i guess was i just looked around and i just saw myself treading water trying not to drown in an ocean mm. of burnt out and traumatized mm. health professionals mm. let's um let's go back to that time if you're open to it i'd love to hear about how you moved from calling what you were in burnout to, oh, wait, there's something Mm. else here. Um, Mm -hmm. Can you describe that process? Well, first of all, I think when it first happened, it happened in such a strange way. I was, it was the 10 year anniversary of the war in Syria. I was doing a BBC interview We just released a second panorama doc bbc panorama documentary and i suddenly had an outer body experience i i was looking at myself during the interview and i was like Hmm. what the fuck am i i'm still doing this wow after 10 years i'm still talking about hospitals and schools being bombed and it was like a moment where my brain just went i just couldn't compute anymore it was like it was like I felt like the biggest failure that had ever existed mm. on planet Earth. Mm. Um, it was like I had I'd lost my sense of purpose. I'd lost any sense mm. of ability. Um, I was exhausted, and uh, it was like I was just I, I, I was I, I yeah it was 
it was the beginning of falling into that valley of darkness. And so for a long time, I didn't even call it burnout because I was I was just all over the place. I just felt broken, like I was losing my mind. You know, you're mm. sobbing one minute, you're furious the next. You couldn't think. Mm. The brain fog was unbelievable. It was like, think, think, think. I just felt like Homer, you know. Oh, you know, it's just like, <laughs> what? I used to be intelligent. How come I can't rub two brain cells mm. together right now, you know? Mm. Wow. And so then you're like, okay, well, I guess I must be exhausted. I need to take a holiday. And then I kind of very quickly realized, no. This isn't a holiday. I'm going to cut this. This is 10 years of not dealing with any of the grief and mm. the trauma. This is 10 years of just acting through it, of act, being an activist through it, of suppressing, repressing, denying all of those things. And um, and honestly, I didn't know what to do for a long time, you know, Um because for a long time, for months, every time I did try and get near it, that voice of shame would come up. Mm. Wow. It was like a like a guardian somehow, yeah. you know, like was just sort of like stopping me from mm-hmm. wanting to deal with it. And mm-hmm. um, and so the first thing that was foundational and, and created the first breakthrough for me was when I started to a self-compassion practice mm. Wow! that was the first thing like I remember I was sat down to do my own compassion practice and for the first time I turned it on myself and I was like and you and you have suffered mm. so much and sacrificed so much and I just it cracked me right open mm. and I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed but it was the first acknowledgement in years of my own pain and suffering and what I had been through myself. And, and I recognized that there was something in that. And so I just kept practicing it and practicing it and practicing it. And the more that I practiced it, the more I was able to get closer and closer to my pain. And then the more that I was able to not judge it, Hmm. um, the more that I was able to, uh, explore it. And then as I started to sort of explore different things like breath work, psychedelic therapy, my yeah. own uh, meditation and prayer, I'm a Sufi. So my, my spiritual mm. practice was foundational in my own um, therapy. Chigun was foundational. And I remember the very moment when I suddenly thought, oh, I'm not in fight and flight anymore. Mm. And I had no idea that I had been in it for 10 years. And that was the beginning of me going, I need to look into this. Like this, Mm -hmm. what is this thing that I'm going through? So like that was when I, the personal and spiritual journey related to the professional journey of now looking into and learning about trauma and realizing Oh, holy crap. You know, I have been mm. saying how untraumatized I am. Well, it's quite the opposite, it would seem, you know. I just I just didn't know that all of these things were were it. Yeah, it's quite stark for me, uh, the contrast between how I was taught as a child to believe that my family was normal and healthy Mm -hmm. and uh and that the presence of trauma was a unusual phenomenon right um that poor person over there who you know experienced a rape or something like that Mm -hmm. and come you know coming up through my training and beginning to practice psychiatry and then finally starting to relate to my own trauma and my own history suddenly realizing wow uh it's not one out of 20 it's not one out of five it's like we're all dealing with something and uh you know it's it, it at the risk you know i i think i think um it's interesting in my thinking about trauma and how at the effect of trauma the world is still Mm. everywhere 
mm. I um, I want to make sure that the messages that I communicate are not um, used to make, oh, well, trauma is everywhere. So there's nothing to do. And it's just, you know, it becomes a contrite uh, blanket thing if it's not if we don't appreciate the the profundity of how damaged we are and how damaged the planet is as a result of the the traumatic lens, you talk about um, the traumatized professor in the medical school or the system that's traumatized, traumatizing the young or the the trainees. It's I see it also in in climate and um, you know and how we relate to food cultivation and what's happening with children and technology and obesity and it's 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 so overwhelming 100%. sometimes yeah yes yeah a hundred percent um and i love that you but there's started... everything to say about it right like because i yeah. yes it's everywhere but here's the thing we can do something about it yeah. especially now with some of these newer tools yeah. that we have at our disposal right Absolutely. um you know so um Yes, I completely agree with you. It's everywhere, but it is something that we need to therefore recognize and do something about it. It's within the grasp right. of our hands. It's something that we actually can impact and affect. I totally agree. And it's it's so exciting that we have new tools uh, coming online. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to, to find out a lot in the next 10 years about how we can make these for example psychedelic therapy available to as many people as possible and and really get the yes. right tool in the right hands mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, medical folks who i meet are are kind of shifting their careers and moving more in the direction toward trauma resolution or at least trauma inf informed care within their their own specialty yes. of training it's very mm -hmm. exciting it is really exciting. That's certainly where where I'm headed, and and I think I love that, and I salute that. But we have to maintain that at the heart of this, and by this I mean, how do we heal our traumas? Is taking this holistic approach. Yes, we mustn't swap the medications that never work for a medication that does work and forget that actually we need to heal emotional wounds. Actually that at the heart of trauma is a fracturing of the spirit. And it is that illusion of separateness that keeps us just in perpetual suffering. And so we need to be talking about it at the spiritual level, the emotional level, the mental level and, and, and healing in community. Yes. Right. Like there is, there's the individual healing we need to do, but there is such a big piece around the collectiveness of it and sharing in that pain and sharing in that healing. And so I, I just urge that we all who are now doing this work don't just swap a tool for a tool, but that we actually 100%. overhaul the way that we are doing it back because healing is about wholeness and we need to bring that wholeness into how we into how we do it. I hundred percent agree with you. And you know, there's there's a danger inside of the wave of psychedelic medicine that's coming, and I see it all the time, of a conventional framework for for psychedelic medicine, right? Exactly. And, and a reductionistic model that's once again in the quick in, fix. It's a quick fix. It's a biological right. tool. It, it's not a spiritual healing tool. Right. And 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 I I love what you said about fractured spirit because you know similar to our earlier conversation about burnout and trauma, I think we also misdiagnose spiritual illness as depression. Mm. Uh, and when you think about the fracturing of essential relationships, right? The relationship to the self, relationship to other, relationship to nature. Yes. Um, I see these as spiritual illnesses that yes. um, don't have a biological result or biological resolution alone, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? No, they and don't. And 
I mean, and, and you know, the indigenous cultures know that, right? Mm. Um, um, a lot of these traditional societies know that my ancestors knew that people used to come to my grandfather and my great grandfather for them to pray mm. for them, mm. right? And read the Quran for them. So they recognized that there were illnesses as well as methodologies that were beyond what the physician was able to offer. Um, and, and that, that needs to be incorporated into that into that wholeness and and i think a big part of why and how psychedelics especially something like mushroom works is 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 nature and that it's that rewilding and re-earthing that we need to do and this is something that i do with some of my clients is like how do we slow down and get back into our bodies and get back into attention and you know and so we do things just like you know like walking with barefoot on the ground and actually like with herbs touching them and feeling them and almost sort of like you know in a sensual way even like to actually feel what they look like and smell like and sound like just that idea of just how do we calm our nervous system by using all the tools around us of which nature is such a profound 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 tool right and within within the restoration of our contact with nature what i i really appreciate what you're saying about the senses and how we can come mm. into the present through our senses mm. and you know the the smell of uh rosemary you know or an essential oil that really evokes um presence uh wakefulness yes um, so so many tools that mm-hmm. um we don't think about in conventional medicine psychiatry for sure mm. um one thing and they're I, kind of laughed about almost and in, in, you know in so many right. in so many circles you know i think sure. it, it's it it probably took me a few months to gather the courage to start to talk about these more supposedly alternative you right. know um things and you know i mean to talk even about spirituality with medicine i mean my god i'll probably have my medical bloody degree <laughs> withdrawn do you know what i mean it's, she's talking about god yeah. the quick burn her you know it's just right like, it's not so much with you guys in the u.s but you know we've let we've thrown god out with the bathwater you know so <laughs> so <laughs> well there is definitely a growing community of integrative minds and thinkers in medicine and uh we're doing the best we can over here with their institute to uh, help people develop these um, broader, layered, in, inter you know interdisciplinary tools uh, to their patients. Uh, so it is happening. But there, there's also a website here called Quack.com that you'll end up on if you <laughs> if you go too far. <laughs> okay, yeah. But mental no, do not end on end up in Quack.com. <laughs> I remember reading reading somewhere that in medicine, in, in in the history of medicine, that you know, the innovators, the first thing they do is they uh they excommunicate you. Uh and then they study your thoughts, and then eventually your thoughts become the standard of care, but it takes a hundred years or something like that. Right, exactly. You're like churning yeah. in your grave by then. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um well you know, one of the profoundest shifts that I am so grateful to God for is is going from being seeing myself as a savior to being a servant. Mm. I think one of the things that burns us out is that huge burden of responsibility that we put on ourselves to save to save, save the planet, save each other and and mm. we um inadvertently altruistic as it seems much as it has driven so much of my impact i mean how it's made helped me to build seven hospitals and impact four million people i'm grateful for that but at the same time not only did it overburden me but when you are a savior it creates a relationship of hierarchy right right if i am the savior that means you're the saved and mm. i am the powerful and you the powerless Sure. And 
how can I possibly ask for help and say I'm struggling and admit vulnerability if I am the savior with a cape around my neck, right? And so it kind of not only it disempowers others, but it eventually completely exhausts us in what is essentially an utterly unachievable thing. You, you can never take away all of that suffering. Right. What One thing that can do and I fundamentally believe that is if we all start to deal with our own traumas, if we all start to heal our own traumas, then we will start to break that cycle of violence, of trauma, of war. We will stop traumatizing each other and our worlds. Um, and there lies, in there lies our, 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 you know, salvation, as it were. But this idea of being a savior that so many of us in the medical profession have is actually so damaging to ourselves and to the profession and to our pa patients who we are inadvertently disempowering rather than saying to them, you know, I, like I tell them now, like, don't come to me for healing. Like, you are not broken. You don't need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. I will hold a space. Yes. I now know how your suffering cannot overwhelm me. I will hold a space and I will remind you of your own innate ability to heal, of God's ability to help heal you. I will provide you with all my wisdom, my knowledge, my tools, but know that this is going to be your work and you can do it. Mm. And I'm here to remind you of how effing amazing you are and you can do it, right? But it really... Mm. It really is no longer for me this idea of your I'm I'm here to save you. And that's yeah. been a big shift for me. Huge, huge. It it reminds me of um when I got involved in MDMA assisted therapy uh for PTSD in a clinical trial about 10 years ago. In the beginning of my training, it was explained to me that the therapeutic approach involves a concept called the inner healing intelligence or the inner healer. Mm -hmm. And I was coming from a open-minded, uh, but not de decidedly not a psychedelic perspective as I entered my training. And I thought, okay, so the inner healer in the client is going to heal the client. Um, and to be honest, and this is a little embarrassing to say, but it, it goes to my training. Well, where do I get to say something really smart that helps the person? Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh? Yeah, exactly. And, and <laughs> but how told, am I going to seem so good? Yeah. <laughs> what about me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this is so, not why I did this profession. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And and my, I remember uh, Michael Mithoffer saying, well, You'll just, you know, you'll see how it goes and you'll learn that this actually works. And it was quite incredible as we, as I learned the the approach and, and, and we supported people with MDMA and their therapy sessions, severe PTSD, chronic PTSD, people with um, on average about 29 years of, of, of trauma in their history who went through this trial and two thirds of them came out no longer meeting criteria for PTSD after three MDMA sessions. But what happened in the sessions was the something about the holding environment and the relationship and the support of the medicine uh, brought forward this intelligence, this, this uh, inner divinity, I would say. And it blew my mind to watch people healing themselves. And it completely turned my understanding of what psychiatry was and what therapy was on its head. It was so amazing to be relieved of the burden of being the savior mm. and to watch the healing unfold in a way that was way more profound than it ever could be mm. if it was, so, so to speak, coming from the, the guide or the healer rather than yeah. coming from inside the person. So yeah, th thank you. Yeah. Well, it's a co it's a co-creation, right? Right. Like, Every time I wanted to try and hasten my recovery, I would remind myself that my only job now is to become a healing presence. And that means doing mm -hmm. the work that I needed in order to become that. And in, in so being it and becoming it, that is the work. Mm -hmm. 
And time and time again, when I sit down to meditate and in our Sufi meditations, we we meditate on the 99 names of, of the divine and and the message, it's the same message every single time. Your job is to be a healing presence. Mm. The healing itself will be done by the person and by the divine. Mm. Your job mm. is to be a healing presence. And so that's like at a physiological level for us is about having our nervous system well regulated, right? right? So that we can be that co-regulating presence mm. um, and, and to be constantly doing the work, the clear out, the letting go that we need to do so that we can be as compassionate and present as possible. So I absolutely believe that our presence is can be a contributing or a deterrent factor. Um, um, and that holding that space is is such an important thing, but right. it but it's to be a catalyst. Exactly. I, I agree hundred percent. It's not a passive role. It's a it's a co co-created role, mm -hmm. e even if it is a lot more subtle than interpreting someone else's experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm wondering about what you're up to now um, with all of this transformation in your life and your point of view and your career. Mm. Um, mm. What's what what what's your what's your daily, weekly, monthly life look like these days? Mm. Great question. The truth is, it's still evolving. What I do know is that. Um, my previous way of practicing medicine is no longer where I'm at. I have evolved from that. I am certainly medicine woman still, but its expression of it has now changed. And I'm now working with um, who I call frontliners, health workers, aid workers, social entrepreneurs, people who are driven to, to, to make the world a better place to first and foremost, remind them of, of what the poet Rumi says. Yesterday, I was clever, so I tried to change the world. Today, I am wise, so I'm changing myself. And so I work with these incredible frontliners to help them do the recovery from burnout and trauma that they need to do and to do that inner change that they need to do so that they can be that healing presence and that that catalyst that they want and that our world needs. Um, and so I'm kind of integrating um, a lot of the things that we talked about, you know, here, the, the um, breath work, psychedelic, spiritual coaching um, um, and um, meditation into, um, you know, each one's bespoke journey. But that at its heart is about me holding that space. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to see where this year is going to take me. I'm already starting to plan some in-person events um, mm -hmm. around the six senses and around slowing down to embody and to get back into our bodies and, and really how do we use the senses in order to bring greater presence and awareness and attention. Um, and um, looking to hold my first retreat at the end of the year. So um mm -hmm. Congratulations. And it's exciting. Thank you. It is exciting. And 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 I also am, you know, I am calling in my soul collaborators. Like I feel like they're um, you know, those of us who are doing this kind of work mm. need to, you know, pull our forces together and mm. um and do that. And so um yeah, I trust that. I trust that the people who need my support will come to me and 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 those who I'm 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 due to collaborate with will also will also come and and I'm yeah excited to see what what a reimagined medicine could look like because mm -hmm. medicine is so beautiful and I still am that physician at the very heart but we need to revolutionize yes how it's delivered and at its core that is physician heal thyself 100 percent. we cannot keep hauling ourselves into battle deeply wounded we cannot heal the world when we are deeply wounded so we must do that work on ourselves 
Um, and then, as you said so beautifully with the patient, you know, and then watch it all unfold beautifully. Hmm. Thank you. Hmm. I, uh, I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that sometimes. <laughs> I, uh, I wonder how mm. how would you like to? Well, well, one question I had for you uh, mm. as we get close to wrapping up was um, around the medical folks who might be listening who are interested not only in doing the work um, mm -hmm. of, of, of healing themselves, but also would like to get involved and um, go, go further than just the uh, doctor patient encounter and, mm -hmm. and maybe expand uh, their impact to, mm -hmm. to activism or, or pitching in in different ways. Mm -hmm. What, what, would you have words of advice for someone who's interested in doing that? Mm -hmm. Great question. I would say, first of all, really um, gather yourself as to what you really think your gifts and talents are. Mm -hmm. Because when we deploy those, that's when not only... Um, you know, do we find that like va va voom energy coming <laughs> from God knows where, you know, mm -hmm. but that's when you really are that much more impactful. So, you know, um, I discovered by accident that I was a powerful communicator. And so like that I know is one of my weapons of choice now. And so, so what are your gifts? What are your talents? Um, and then um, for me, the second thing will be what are the causes that really get you you know here and mm -hmm. in, in in the heart you know because again when we work on things that are meaningful to us we find that energy from from deep within so you know that could be country related gender related politics related you know whatever it is mm -hmm. but what is that thing that you really care about um and then the third and final thing i would say is go as local as possible mm -hmm local people for local solutions mm -hmm. and 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 you know it it's the syrians who are helping the syrians it's the somalis who are helping the somalis and we do need the global community everyone around the world needs that global support but don't come in as that white woman and white man savior mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. da, 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 i'm coming to save you but come in and say you know find out who is here who is doing what and how can i serve mm -hmm. you Mm, you know, okay. so look into what local groups, organizations, activists, grassroots organizations are working on that and offer them the support that they need, because mm. that that I believe is how we empower others with dignity to create the change um, mm. and how we can be great allies mm. um, in in support of that. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for asking that. Um, one of my dreams is that is to set up an activist school. So um, we'll we'll see. I hope that uh, maybe I can. I'll I'll come back in in a few years' time, and and I'll be telling you about my uh, my 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 school of wise warriors. I look forward to that. <laughs> maybe like you'll be on the faculty. I would love that. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> If anyone here is listening, <laughs> let's make this happen. Calling in the collaborators. <laughs> wow. What, what, what a pleasure to connect with you, Rolla. Thank you for, Thank for joining you. us and for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for making the journey, listening to the inner call to wholeness and slowing down and, and turning around and offering uh, the gifts that you have cultivated to others it's it's very inspiring and um thank you thank you i was really honored to have this conversation and um i hope it will be of service to to whomever needed to hear it <laughs>